In today's video, we're going to look into some reloading questions that I have always wondered about. Questions like, how many firings can you actually get out of a single piece of brass? How many rounds do you need to fire on a clean board before you can rely on the velocity data? Basically, how important are fouler rounds? As cases get more firings on it, should the expected velocity change? For the testing we ran today, we essentially ran three separate tests. What is different than normal is the brass that we used, and the fact that we could actually conduct the testing in the same location we were reloading. This allowed us to test the same piece of brass repeatedly on the same day, something I have not been able to accomplish until now. For today's video, we're going to be looking at the velocity response as the brass increases in the number of firings. The tests for today are going to be ran in 6.5 Creedmoor, so different calibers will perform differently. Regardless, I still think you may find this interesting, and some of this information might still apply to your application. For all of our tests today, the pool of brass, 140 grain ELDM and H4350 are all going to be consistent among all of our tests. We're actually going to be using two separate primers. The first primer is the CCI41, small rifle primer, and the other primer we'll be using is the Fed 205M. The test platform we're using is a Ruger Precision Rifle, chambered in 6.5 Creedmoor. This has had the barrel replaced with a 26 inch Bartland barrel. For our first test, kind of wondering how many firings we can get on a single piece of brass, we're going to be using one of my favorite loads. 41.3 grains of H4350 behind the 140 grain ELDM. When using the small rifle primer brass, I've had good luck with the CCI41. This load was not tuned for this particular rifle, but it's worked well in just about every one I've tried it in so far. So to start off our test, we're taking one single fresh piece of the Velapoa brass, loading it up. The cartridge overall length we'll be using is 2.820 inches. After every single firing to prepare it for the next round, will be annealing, full length sizing for a 2000 shoulder bump with no expanding device in place. Next, we'll be actually lubing the inside of the necks with graphite and using a .262 expander mandrel to set the inside diameter of the case. After this, we're going to be trimming with our Gerard trimmer, trimming the cases back to 1.910 inches, chamfering into burring all in the same step. The biggest difference between this test and my normal reloading process is wet tumbling. To get all these tests run the same day, I obviously do not have time to wet tumble in between tests, but we are going to be wiping the cases clean after every step the best that we can. For our first test, we're actually going to be answering multiple questions at the same time. Before we started our test today, we had not cleaned the rifle completely, but we had run a bore snake through it with some ballast all on it. To start our testing today, we actually had a cold bore. We had done no fouling shots because one of the things we wanted to understand was how that fouling shot was going to affect a clean barrel. Right out of the gate, we're starting with a cold bore, clean barrel, and fresh brass. We'll put our velocity chart on the screen and we can see that our first round of the day started off at 2766 feet per second and we'll never actually get to that velocity again. Our second reload of the same case dropped down to 2700 feet per second. Looking at our velocity chart, I think it's fair to say that we actually didn't reach an equilibrium in the barrel until we'd reached that fifth shot. A velocity around 2740 feet per second is what I would expect out of this round and all subsequent reloads of this same case yielded a velocity somewhere in that area. As you can see, our chart goes out to 20 reloads, which is how far I took this case. Now, I would love to tell you that I actually took this case to failure, and in a way I did. But when we talked about our reloading process, when we talked about the dry lube, when I was going for the 21st reload, I mistakenly had one of the ceramic balls still stuck in the case when I ran the expander mandrel through it, which put a ding in the neck of the case. I'm certain that case would have gone further. How much further, I don't really know. But I do think this is a very interesting piece of information. With no damage caused to the case except by my accident, with a very reasonable charge of H4350, these cases will last a very long time. When I was using a different brand of brass that had large rifle primers in it before, the number of reloads I was getting on a different brand of brass was somewhere around 6 to 8. Since then, I pretty much stuck with a more premium brass like Lapua, and I haven't been disappointed. Getting all the way to 20 reloads and not seeing any degradation in the performance is pretty interesting to me. Now, if you're interested in the overall statistics, if you want to include every single round, the average velocity was 2737 feet per second, standard deviation of 14.2, extreme spread of 66. But again, I don't think we normalized our barrel conditions until our fifth shot, excluding the first four, which are obviously out of family. The average velocity goes to 2740, standard deviation of 7.3, extreme spread of 24. Not perfect statistics, but certainly reasonable. For our next test, we used exactly one more piece of brass, and I thought it would be interesting if we got to develop our velocity curve with a single piece of brass. If we could eliminate the variation from case to case, maybe we could zero in on those velocity sweet spots just a little faster. Now for this next test, we're using again the same components, except we've switched to the Fed 205M, in essence to simulate switching to a different primer. 
Though I still have some in stock, my CCI 41s are getting a little slim, so I thought it'd be interesting to try this with a different primer and see how it reacted and see how our load tuned out. For our next complete test, we're firing 10 rounds in one tenth of a grain increment increases to see if we can see the velocity increases and see where we can get repeated bowl velocity. This is similar to the 10 round Saturday test, but again, we're really only tuning in to see where we can find that consistent velocity response. And assuming we have a repeatable reloading process, hopefully we'll be able to zero in on these velocity nodes just a little faster. We're going to be testing from 41 grains all the way to 41.9 grains in one tenth of a grain increments. Besides the primer, everything's going to be the same as before, starting with a single piece of Lapa unfired brass and consistently reloading it. Now, since we'd ran our other tests previously, we can note we're not going to see any unusual velocities with our first round. In fact, at 41 grains, we're going to start right off at 27, 21 feet per second. And we can see somewhere around 41.5 grains at 27, 62 feet per second, we've zeroed in on a fairly repeatable load, just a touch faster than the average velocity of our previous test. This test was ran identical to the last one. Every single step between tests, annealed, full length size, trimmed, chamfered, and deburred, neck tension set exactly. So if we were picking a load to test out of here, I would pick the 41.5 grains of H4A350. And that's exactly what we did to get on to the third stage of this test. Keep in mind our single piece of brass had already 10 firings on it. We're going to run 10 more. Reloading the same piece of brass 10 identical times, our average velocity response was 2761 feet per second with a standard deviation of 5.8 and an extreme spread of 19. And since we'd ran our last piece of brass to 20 rounds, that's exactly what we did and where we stopped. There was no measurable damage of this round and overall I think it did allow us to zero in on a very acceptable load. 41.5 grains, just slightly higher than we were testing before. Certainly a better SD, better extreme spread and just a little bit more velocity. Who knows, if we'd actually ran the same charge in our last piece of brass, maybe we'd have had a better standard deviation in that test as well. Though I don't think this testing is earth shattering, I do think there's some interesting information that we can glean from the data. Among those things, how long can a piece of brass last? Well, in this case, well over 20 rounds. We're not taking this right up to maximum case pressure, but these loads are no joke, and I've seen lesser brass fail way before these 20 rounds. So this just reinforces one of the reasons why I think it's worth it to buy just a little bit more expensive of brass, especially if you can see this quality difference. The second thing I've always wondered is how many fowlers do I really need? And, and I think our testing today has an interesting answer to that. In some cases previously, I've only fired one or two ciders just to make sure I was on target before I started my testing. But it appears if I've cleaned my barrel, I need to fire at least five rounds to make sure that my barrel is somewhat equalized with its fouling before I begin my testing. Putting up our first test over here, one of the things I was very interested in to see how consistent the velocity was and if it trended in a particular direction. Keeping in mind, we're trimming this case every single time. Now it's not excessive, but we are trimming it. So essentially the case capacity is increasing with every round. Excluding our cold bore shot, we seem to see the velocity increase until shot 11 and then decrease slightly. It shot 17, that 2751. I'm not for sure if I forgot to brush out the case neck on that. I can't be certain either way. So draw your own conclusion if, if that's random error or not. It seemed very unusual that we, our velocity seemed to climb, come back down, and then start climbing again. One thing I certainly wish is that I'd had my inline cedar set up so I could be monitoring the neck tension as we ran this test. Something I hope to do in the future if I get a chance to repeat this testing. As far as developing your initial velocity curve when you start to do load development, if you're looking for velocity nodes, I think that reloading in one case is a valuable tool. Therefore, you don't have to worry about the differences from case to case. Assuming you can exclude any variation in your reloading process, which is a rough assumption, this may be an interesting way of zeroing in on those velocity nodes without having to worry about any variation from case to case. Though I don't think any of this data is particularly earth shattering, I do think it's an interesting piece of information and I might want to build on it in the future. Most specifically, I'd really like to see how the seating force changed from round to round to see if that actually showed up in our velocity response. Loading various tests in the same case seems like an interesting way of possibly reducing case-to-case -case variation and coming to a cleaner conclusion. But I'd love to hear your feedback in the comment section below. Have you run any testing like this? If you so, what would you change? What did you do different? If nothing else, I think today's test gave me a good baseline for how repeatable my reloading process was and at least gave me a baseline to work from. Should I make some upgrades or at least what I think to be upgrades, I'll have at least a baseline to test it from Maybe we'll make some changes and see if we can get that extreme spread down even smaller. 
If you're one to really geek out on this stuff like I am, you're going to want to check out my neck tension video to see how neck tension actually affects the performance of your reloads. If not that, YouTube thinks there's another video here you're going to enjoy. Thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you come back next week. And until then, stay safe in small groups.